We're very honored this morning to have a very special guest with us, our Day of Recollection director. He is Abbot Patrick Berry, the former abbot of Ampleforth Abbey in England. And uh, I'd like to read to you some biographical information that he kindly supplied me a couple of weeks ago. He was born in 1917 in Cheshire, England, of Irish parents. Later this year, he's going to be 90 years old. His father was a doctor. Uh, his family consisted of three sisters and one brother. Regarding his education, he says that the first attempt was made by the Jesuits who passed me on to the Benedictines at Ampleforth. He joined the community in 1935. He made solemn profession in 1939. He was ordained a priest in 1945. He was at Oxford University from 1938 to 1942, where he read or studied Latin and Greek, philosophy, and ancient history. He taught at Ampleforth College, equivalent of our high school. He was housemaster and second master from 1954 to 1964. He was headmaster again. He was headmaster from 1964 to 1979. Then he did four years of pastoral work in Benedictine parishes in Cardiff and South London. He was the abbot of Ampleforth Abbey from 1984 to 1997 when he retired at the age of 80. And since 1997, he's been in residence at St. Louis Abbey here in uh, St. Louis, uh, where he's been working with the lay Benedictine community in Chile, developing strong associations with Ampleforth and with St. Louis Abbeys. Abbot, Father Abbot, we're very Honored to have you with us, and we're anxious to hear what you have to say. Thank you for coming. Well, to complete the introduction, this is Michael Kramer, who is one of our oblates and has undertaken to be my minder today, which I'm very grateful. But you see, I'm decrepit in all, re all respects. First of all, I drop everything on the floor, and I can't be let out alone now, because I can't cope with it. In fact, I am overwhelmed by supreme wonder at my being here. I'm deeply, deeply grateful for the invitation which helps to prove to me that I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and I hope I do something to live up to expectations, at least the expectations of the Holy Spirit, who is very capable of dealing with the lame, the halt, and the blind. Because I'm going blind also. Now, uh, one, one little item which Father Tom omitted from my little biography was that in, 19, in 2005, no, not, one, not 19,000, not, not all that time ago, but 2005, I underwent a cancer operation which took nine and a half hours. And surviving that was quite something. There are all sorts of fascinating things I could tell you about that, but that's not what I'm here for. I only just want to say that two doctors, one was the surgeon and the other was my internist, after it was all over and I went to be inspected by them again, they both independently referred to my miraculous recovery. Now, that's not the sort of thing that doctors are in the, in the way of saying. They talk about medical miracles, but they were talking about miracles from the Lord, and we're surrounded with them all the day. We're just not very good at recognizing them. 
There was no question of my recognizing the miracle of my cure. And when I was thinking, first of all, about what to say to you, I remembered that Newman, when he was called to preach to a group of seminarians at the opening of a new seminary in 1873 in England, made a prophetic warning to them. Now, Newman, one of the biggest characteristics of Newman, in my opinion, is his extraordinary prophetic spirit. He talked in the mid-19th century and late 19th century in a way which really only made sense a hundred years later. And one of the things he said to them is that they were going into a world which was different from anything the church had experienced in its long life before. And he then went on to justify it. And the point he was making was that they were going into a world which was simply irreligious. And that the church had never had to deal with before. It had to deal with all sorts of false gospels and idolatrous and false religious religions. But now, in the world you are going into, he said in 1873, it is going to be a world which is quite simply irreligious. Well, in fact, that was utterly true, but it was approximately 100 years in advance of its time, perhaps 150. And every syllable that he said has become true in our age. For instance, as I was thinking about this only the other day, about the infidelity of the world. My attention was drawn to an article in the Sunday Times supplement. You won't usually find me um, reading the New York Times, least of all its supplement. Oh no, I've given that up long ago. And I've been pretty faithful to my resolve. But this one was riveting because it was all written on a we-they assumption. We, the uh, greatest production of this modern age, don't have anything to do with God or all that sort of stuff. That's all finished with. They are still muttering around about God, poor things. And there was a good deal of compassionate sympathy for the people who were finished with. That's you. And it was quite, quite fascinating. He summed it up by saying that there is a, a great divide, a great separation between God and politics. That's obvious. And by politics, he meant, as it seemed, everything that matters in human life for human beings. Not just um, the election time politics, but the, the real life and the separation between God and that. It's all place based, every word of it, on an utterly blind assumption that religion is irrelevant to human life. Now, it's happened. It's over. Newman's prophecy has come true. Well, don't be worried. Because 
he left out the most important thing that behind you in your mission will be the Holy Spirit himself the Spirit of Christ present among us and you will be sent out in persona Christi who faced in his, his own way an equally impossible <coughs> task and you will be sent out to preach the gospel to heal to inspire and to console and to face the impossible task just like the apostles long ago of converting the unconvertible with nothing nothing to rely on except the weapons of the spirit of God himself As for those who think of Christianity as a political movement, it is well to follow Newman again in asking, <coughs> well, how did the early Christians convert the Roman world? How did they go about it? It was a formidable task. The Roman world was the civilized world. The Roman world was the world of order <coughs> and organization. And the Roman world just didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity and worked out a very, very simple way of abolishing it. After trying persecution in various ways in various places <coughs> finally under the emperor Decius and the great persecutor <coughs> Diocletian they took a very simple course all the magistrates <coughs> throughout the Roman world throughout the Mediterranean <coughs> were instructed to summon <coughs> every Christian before them, everyone, and to present them with an altar to the emperor and a pile of incense and a brazier. Okay? You say, you obey the emperor, obey him. Worship his image. Throw some incense at the brazier. It's not very much, but there's little things to do. Oh, and by the way, you must bring to me every article of writing, books especially, which have anything to do <coughs> with that criminal who our capable governor Pontius Pilate annihilated in Palestine. We must bring them here and we will burn them in that furnace. Every single Christian was faced with that. And that was the final plan of annihilation, which came to its peak at the time of Diocletian. So there wasn't ever getting away with it. So how did the, the apostles and their successors managed to survive, and not only to survive, but to grow and grow and grow, even under those hideous persecutions. They prevailed by reflecting in the lives they lived, the living Christ of the resurrection himself, and teaching others how to do the same. They were the mirrors of Christ. And what about us? In a culture in which God is becoming increasingly irrelevant, in which that simple perception of the New York Times, that he is irrelevant, is strengthened 
by mankind's assumption of supreme confidence, of supreme power to decide everything, where values are relativized, where truth is ignored or denied according to convenience. And that's the world you are faced with. And it's going to get worse. We need to recapture to meet this and to cherish always a simple but compelling vision of the truth about our human condition with all additions cast away. The truth about our human condition which applies to all mankind, the rich and the poor, and everyone. First of all, that we ourselves are not omnicompetent. We are created. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. And without him was made nothing that was made. And when the word was made flesh, then came a second step. We were recreated. We were made new by Christ. You remember, as St. Paul said, you are a new creation. You are a creation which is utterly new through the grace of God. Not through your efforts, not through any human efforts, of, nor through any human achievement. You are a new creation through the grace of God and nothing else. So those are the two primary simple facts about us. We are a creation. We are a double creation. The original creation and the new creation of grace. As to our initial creation, it is indeed a revealed act of the past. It is also the spirit in the spirit, an intimate perception of the present. That, uh, that initial creation has come down to us here and now and we are as much God's immediate creation as those in the beginning. Once perceived, it cannot be eradicated, this truth. It lives in more human hearts than ever admitted. I was associated once long ago with a trust in Oxford which had been formed by a Nobel Prize, Prize winner, a biologist. And he had developed a theory that religion, the perception of the spirit and of God, is much more widespread than people seem to assume. In fact, he argued it as a very broad-minded biologist that this perception was an essential part of the creature called Christ. 
I once, when I was headmaster, <clears throat> invited a professor of Russian in a local university to lecture to the boys who were learning Russian. And I had a talk with her and asked her where she came from. From a village near Smolensk, she said. For Smolensk is the first great town that the invaders of Russia, Napoleon and then Hitler, came to. She was from a village near Smolensk. Oh, I said, how interesting. Now, tell me about life under the Soviets. She said, well, in our village, you see, um, the Nazis arrived when I was still only 12 or so. But all up to that time, in our village, God wasn't allowed. We knew, of course, that there was some mysterious secret which our adults, particularly our grandparents had, which they couldn't tell us. We thought it was just they wouldn't tell us. But we discovered later that it was they couldn't tell us because our teachers would find out and then they would be off to the Gulag archipelago. So they lived in a reign of terror terror of the word God. And she said, there was a church at the end of the village which was boarded up. Nobody was allowed near it. Of course, she said, tell children they're not allowed near somewhere and they'll go. We found ways. We got there. But it was boarded up. And we peered between the cracks wondering and yarning to each other about what had happened in there. And so she said, I grew up with the profound conviction that God is a mystery. And then she had indeed an interesting life because when the Nazis were thrown back and the Russians were coming back, she knew too much about the Soviets already to risk anything. So by this time she was about 16 or so, 16 or 17, and she just walked to the west. And she walked during the night and hid up during the day and eventually got into some Allied occupied territory and was taken to what in those days were called a camp for displaced persons. She was a displaced person. And eventually they offered her to train her to be a nurse. And she went to England to train to be a nurse. And that all went very well. And then she managed to get a university job to teach Russia. And there she was. I said, well, what about God? Oh, yes. I believe in God much more than a lot of the people I meet who say they are Christians believe. I believe in him very, very profoundly as the greatest mystery in the world. There was another story of those times which I remember, and that was, <coughs> I was very much convinced reading things about Russia and one of the very distinguished um, Russians called Krashenko who escaped wrote a fascinating account of it and he told a story that when he was in the Air Force at the great, the terrible the, the monstrous 
battle of Stalingrad. He was in a Soviet bomber sent on a particular mission. And they were hit by anti-aircraft. And so he and the pilot discussed what they ought to do. Should they risk it and go on and complete their mission? Or should they turn back for safety? Because it was still by, but not very happy. And they decided between them, no, they must complete their mission. So they flew on. And he said, as we agreed on this, and the pilot turned back to his control, he made a great big sign of the cross, like that. And Karachinko said, I thought you were a communist. Oh yes, he said, I am. But in the face of death, Every man's soul is laid bare. What a comment. What a wonderful testimony to the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. And so we must get these two facts deeply in our being, that we are created and that it is only through Christ that we are recreated. And with this perception of our creation and our recreation is the spirit of wonder at our being. And that wonder is the seedbed of all religion. It struck me particularly de deeply after my, my dicing with the angel of death which I am surprised to have won through the Holy Spirit. When I got back to the monastery, and the first day that I attended the choir, Lord Choir, the first psalm was, My soul, give thanks to the Lord. All my being, bless his holy name. My soul, give thanks to the Lord and never forget all his blessing. That, I thought, was a vital step towards maturity in self-realization. So, how do we meet the world of irreligion? Not by return to the three-leveled world of heaven, earth and hell. We have to outface the great illusion that human life is there to be manipulated by man as and how he will. Birth, death, health, sickness. The fulfillment of our being through clever trivialities. The fulfillment of my, our being contrived by clever technology, the false and futile attempt to shake off the restraints of a creature, mankind assuming the status of supreme controller. We must shake all that off. We need to look more realistically at the deep mystery of our total environment, revealed also by our advancing knowledge. I have in my computer a picture which looks rather like an elegant frisbee <coughs> coasting through the air, thrown with enormous skill by the young nowadays, glowing as it goes. But it isn't a frisbee. It's a photograph from the Hubble telescope looking out into outer space. And it's a photograph of a galaxy. 
a whole galaxy looking like a frisbee. It is 28 million light years away. 28 million. It is 10,000 light years across. Well, put in very simple terms, if it is 28 million light years away, then what the Hubble telescope sees is 28 million years out of date. And if we want to see what's actually going on there now, then we've got to hang around for another 28 million years. They don't point that out, the colored supplement. They give the impression that the Hubble telescope is seeing what's happening now. Well, it couldn't be, because even in our own galaxy, the nearest star in our own galaxy, forget about the <coughs> planets and the solar, the solar system, they're only the backyard. The nearest star, so the brilliant scientists tell us, is four light years away. So before we can see what's happening there, we've got to wait four years. So when you look at it, they are <coughs> emphasizing the mystery of human life. And perhaps the only valid respect, uh, response, the only truly valid response, is adoration, thanksgiving, praise, repentance for sin, petition for the grace of God, and for growth in wisdom. That's the program for the future, the only one that will stand up to, uh, to, to um, inspection. After all, it's not through the great advance in human knowledge, it's not that that has solved our greatest human needs. It hasn't even touched our greatest human needs. Our greatest human needs are the mystery of life, the mystery of love, and the mystery of death. Just those three. And true human progress must be centered on them, or it is illusory. The mystery of life, the mystery of love, and the mystery of death. So now let us end with just a little Lectio Divina. I've been too long, I'm sorry, but I'm like that. I lose the scent of time. You shouldn't have invited me. Lectio Divina is now becoming quite popular. It is a word taken from the rule of St. Benedict. And I would like just to say a brief word about it, what it really means and then read slowly with you and for you the scripture which I think is relevant to what we have been talking about. Because Lexio Divina sees the word of God in scripture. Now we become perhaps too fascinated by scholarship and by reading scripture as something out there to be analyzed by us. By looking upon scripture as something which has to go through the hoop of <clears throat> detached human analysis before we can believe in anything. Well, I'm saying nothing about against that. And the more scholarship, the true scholarship we have, the better. But that isn't what Lexio Divina is. Lexio Divina, 
scholars Vatican II in seeing the presence of Christ in the word and listening to that word and believing as Vatican II tells us we should as in that word is the guide to our own life and we have to recognize that we do not see the meaning of that word through intellectual analysis but through the complete openness of our heart to what God is saying to us in the church through Christ here's the first passage in him was life and the life was the light of men the light shines in darkness and the darkness could not comprehend it and then he who has my commandments and keeps them he it is who loves me and he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him then again in the same hour Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said I thank thee Father Lord of heaven and earth that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little ones Yea, Father, for such was thy gracious will. Then again, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except, and one who knows the Son is who the Son is. or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him and then again Jesus said to them truly, truly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you have no life in you he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him as the living father sent him and I live because of the father so he who eats me will live because of me this is the bread which came down from heaven not such as the fathers ate and died he who eats this bread will live forever this he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. We as priests and you who will be priests will be empowered through the sacraments to bring this life to the people of God. Through ordination we are empowered to bring them 
the food of life, which is Christ himself, in the Eucharist and the other sacraments. We are empowered ourselves through our baptism, through our confirmation, and through ordination. To fulfill such a sacred mission in such a difficult time, we ourselves must be always growing closer to him. And prayer is the key to achieving this. Prayer, which is simply the opening of our inner being to his presence, to his love, and to his gracious, loving mastery of our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.